Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this last meeting of the Infrastructure Interest Group of the NDSA. We do not have a speaker today. The, the goal was to sort of look back on 2020 as much as we might all hate to do that and uh, look forward to 2021. And I don't know if Matt Schultz will be joining us or not, but um, in case anyone wasn't at the last meeting, because I think we announced this at the last meeting, but Matt is going to step down as co-chair of the interest group. And Eric uh, Lopatin has been very uh, generous with his time and agreed to step into the co-chair role. I'm very, very grateful to Eric for doing that. Uh, Eric, you want to talk a little bit about yourself and your interests and uh, especially as it re might relate to the interest group. Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you. And um, I think I've met quite a few people in the meeting. So I've been a pretty regular attendee um, this year. So um, I'm really looking forward to uh, working with Leah um, for the next year to help the group out and um, get us uh, you know, get us talking about a lot of interesting topics and finding some presenters and hopefully working with, um, you know, other groups in the NDSA as well. Um, so I, I mean, uh, my background is um, um, I've been at CDL uh, for a little under two years now, and um, I manage the, um, <clears throat> the digital preservation uh, services there. And I work with Terry Brady, who's also here. Um, I feel remember Terry and I did a, a presentation a couple of meetings ago. Um, but yeah, it's, I've been involved with the NDSA uh, a, a little bit on and off. And of course, I've really appreciated um, the Digital Press Conference um, for the past couple of years too, which has been great. Um, before uh, what well, CDL, uh, the main thing that I end up managing is the Merit Preservation Repository uh, and uh, the directions that we end up going there with, um, uh, with the repository technologies and integration with other CDL services. Um, and then we, you know, we try as a, as a team there, we have a team called um, the uh, University of California Curation Team. And um, with all the projects that are there, we, we try to work across all the different UC campuses um, to help different libraries and uh, uh, researchers and other folks um, across the campuses uh, interact with our service, uh, services and, um, and so on and so forth. So um, before CDL, I was at Public Library of Science at PLOS for about uh, four and a half years. And um, you know that was my that was my introduction into open access and uh, to the broader like scholarly publishing uh, landscape. Um, but uh, when I you know when I heard there was a, a, an opening at CDL for preservation, uh, uh, John Shidaki, who I had known beforehand, um, got me interested in that. And uh, of course, all all aspects of preservation are, it's been a great like uh, uh, learning curve and learning experience for me for the past couple of years. So. Um, but that's, um, yeah, that's part of my, part of my background. And uh, like I said, look forward to, to working with you all and talking about a lot of interesting, interesting stuff in the next uh, 12 months and leaving 2020 behind us. So, yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, so let's see. I thought maybe it would be useful to just quickly uh, run through, uh, for those of you who were here a year ago, um, Nathan had set up a Triceter poll for us to, actually this started at the NDSA conference um, in November last year when um, the group met and started to discuss possible topics. And then this poll was set up for people to vote on the topics they were most interested in hearing about. And um, Matt and I used that as sort of our uh, menu of of topics that we tried to find speakers who could come in and speak about. So um, the ideas that I believe we covered this past year uh, were things like local digital preservation levels of commitment, uh, Courtney Muma um, facilitated that discussion. And that's something that I want to sort of put a little bit of a pin in because it was something that we talked about a potential project and that's gonna be a topic of discussion in a moment. Um, 
but then uh, software, Nathan talked about software defined storage. Um, Jane came on and talked about the digital preservation, the storage group at the Library of Congress and their update uh, on storage criteria. Um, let's see, we did fixity in the cloud. I talked about what Google was doing in terms of fixity in the cloud. Um, we had a discussion about blockchain and digital preservation. Uh, Linda ran a discussion on exit strategies um, with digital preservation systems. We had a conversation about cost modeling for cloud storage. And as I'm looking at the list, I think that's everything that was on the list that we actually had speakers about. Um, so if you were not here when we were brainstorming on topics, these were the kinds of things um, that, that people brought up as things that they'd be interested in talking, in hearing more about. So what we'd like to do is start to get those wheels in motion again um, and talk a little bit about what topics are still um, of interest to people. We also uh, would like to talk a little bit about, well, I would like to talk a little bit about how everybody feels about the interest group about what you would like to see the interest group doing before we get into a, a conversation about topics. I'd be interested to hear whether that's what people would like for the interest group even to be doing in terms of setting up um, um, topics and speakers to come uh, discuss those topics. Are there other um, roles that you feel like the interest group could play. Uh, is there anybody who is willing to sort of open up a discussion, give their opinion about the interest group and whether it's meeting your needs? Anyone? Hey. Hey, Jeremy. Um, I am new to the interest group. Uh, I am, I am uh, from Arizona State University Library. Okay. And um, I believe you all know Stacy Erdman, or maybe some of you do. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, she is a colleague, colleague of mine now. Um, I, I just wanted to say all of those things you um, discussed in the last year are highly interesting to us. And it sounds like, um, you know, continued conversations about the cloud would be very interesting, um, especially as, you know, everything just keeps continuing to grow and scale. And um, you know how how things like fixity do apply to the cloud and and things at scale because that is an increasing challenge. I'm looking through the notes right now, and it's kind of like my thought process is aligning with some of this stuff in the notes. Like we almost have to trust to some degree that fixity is occurring because there's no way you're going to crawl through a petabyte of data and verify it all in a timely manner. Um, yeah. So yeah, I just just wanted to say this sounds really cool and um, looking forward to being more involved. So Jeremy, before you um, disappear yourself or anything, <laughs> as a newcomer, it's a uh, useful um, your it's a useful perspective that you bring when you came, when you came on to this interest group. Was that your primary? Um, impression or goal for the uh, for joining the interest group was sort of as an information gathering mechanism is that uh, what is of most value to you in in for the interest group yeah that's that's certainly one of one of the uh, the goals um, you know part of it uh, is of course because Stacy's involved um, I would I certainly want to be involved from the infrastructure point of view, since that's the, the team I, I manage. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just seeing what what other um, areas are doing in this in this regard, uh, making sure the way we're thinking about preservation and the technologies that are aligning with it are on par or not totally insane um, yeah. <laughs> and validating that kind of thing. Uh, all of that is is of interest. 
So for those of you who are not new, um, I'm curious if you feel like the topics that have been covered have been covered at a level uh, that gives you actual actionable information, or is it a more theoretical um, kind of interesting topic, but not directly applicable uh, to what you're actually doing right now? I'd be, love to hear any opinions on that. Uh, aspect of what we're doing. Um, Leah, this is Don. Hey, Don. I, I, um, I would have to say that I found these topics to be very interesting, but more on a finding out what I don't know, rather than things that I specifically want to or can put into action uh, mm -hmm. today. Part of that is is uh, because we've been just so spread so thin. So I can't focus on anything. Yeah. It takes literally years for us to take a, an idea and, and implement it. Um, it it's, it's somewhat uh, like uh, what I get out of that Library of Congress uh, storage seminar, yeah. yep. um, where, I don't know, three years ago, I learned about Wasabi's um, you know, cheap hot storage. And we're just now getting uh, to be putting stuff in there for, for digital preservation. Right. It's taken that long, um, but the things like the the software defined networking, the the use of the Git repositories that Terry was talking about, these are things that I just sort of store away, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to act on them in the future. And so, Don, is that of any frustration to you, or is that of value to you? Are you do you like being able to sort of see what might be coming down the road for you, or do you wish there was more that was immediately actionable for you. I, I, I won't say that that's frustrating because there's so many other frustrating things, you know, <laughs> that um, I, I find uh, these uh, meetings just, you know, lurking on them to be um, uh, a sort of a, an enjoyable time to sort of step back and, and, and think about things in um, a, a large, longer time frame. Okay. Anyone else? like to sort of give us some insight into how you feel about these discussions that we've had over the past year. So one of the things that, um, to, to further ask you about this, this is to extend that question, is um, sort of the, the, the difference between having a presentation for most of the meeting, leaving time for questions, but most of the meeting, versus having a kind of facilitated discussion, giving members of the interest group a chance to sort of talk about their own use cases and things like that. I'd be interested in addition to finding out in general how you feel about the past year, whether or not that particular aspect of it, um, if you have an opinion about that. Any thoughts at all? I mean, I was going to say it, it would be great if in the course of one of these presentations, it sparked like a really uh, robust discussion or robust debate. I think I think the tough thing is it's kind of like, you know, we're a, a niche group and then it is, you know, the people who were present on a particular day may, you know, may or may not have been, you know, wrestling with the same challenges. So I think right. just um, it, it seems to be a group that hits closer to those common problems than than other groups that exist but you probably can't count on the fact that every meeting is going to turn into a really lively discussion yeah i part of the reason for the question is to find out if we should try to ask people who are speaking to leave a greater amount of time for sort of that facilitated discussion of course the danger of that is if there isn't anybody there that day who has anything in particular to discuss, then we've, you know, left a bunch of time that will give us dead air, uh, or we end the meeting early. So, um, but yes, thanks, Terry. I, I agree. It's a little bit of a, a crapshoot in terms of who's who's going to be there that day and what sparks uh, discussion for them. 
I think they're definitely leaving some room for, you know, some, some time and some, maybe even some useful prompts in the course of a presentation to have discussion, but don't, don't be crushed if it doesn't happen. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We definitely had a few this year that went pretty close to the time limit. So there wasn't a whole lot of time left for discussion and we could definitely uh, try to keep an eye on that more in the coming year. Yeah, I remember when um, when Linda Tadic had actually, uh, you know, gone through her presentation and then had a, a series of questions afterwards. We had a really, there were at least, it felt like at least 20 minutes, half hour of, of good solid discussion that happened after that. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious if, <clears throat> you know, if, if, we, if we do go that route, um, you know, what are those questions supposed, you know, like what are the most in, engaging questions that we can ask? What are yes. those? Um, but um, but I, I also kind of wanted to put out there um, something that uh, Leah and Bradley Tegel and I talked about pretty recently is, <clears throat> is, the, is, is there interest in um, not only having uh, speakers and engaging discussions like this, um, but I, I know Bradley is kind of curious about or, or trying to find out like how the interest groups can actually correspond and, and work with the working groups as well. Like how can we pull ad- additional information from um, you know, where we all are at any given time uh, on a particular topic and actually um, have that, uh, I'd say dovetail with something that the working group is interested in hearing uh, or may- maybe would roll into a project that they're working on. So to introduce this more kind of like dynamic uh, or, or introduce a dynamic between the, this interest group and another like NDSA working group. Um, that would, you know, Leah, I know you, you've thought about this too. So if there's anything you wanna add, but I mean, that, that would be something that would kind of like, uh, that might guide some of our discussions and this discussion topics. Um, yeah, so as Eric mentioned, we, he and I uh, talked with Bradley Daigle, who is the outgoing uh, leadership chair. And uh, Bradley had some thoughts that he would, in, uh, about ways that he'd like to see the NDSA moving in terms of interest groups and working groups. And one of the things that I had been thinking about was having a mix within this interest group of sort of this information sharing thing that we have been doing, uh, and I think doing pretty well. Um, so I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm not at all dissatisfied. But I'd also like, uh, I, I also think it's, it's always interesting to be actually working uh, on a project where you're producing something. So something, as, as Bradley said, you know, passive versus active and, and having a good mix of the two. And in addition to the interest group having some level of overlap with the working group, also he'd like to see the interest groups all having more overlap. So that's something that may be happening more over the the next year, we'll have to see. Um, But in his mind, and I think in the way that this would probably go forward is um, topics of interest that sort of spark a project idea, that project would likely spin off into a working group. So it isn't that the interest group itself would be facilitating that project, although they're likely and hopefully would be members of the interest group who would uh, be willing to be part of that working group to do that project. And then part of our itinerary over over the year would be getting feedback from that working group about what was happening and and us giving feedback to that working group about the direction that it's going in and that kind of thing. And I, I'd, I'd be interested in seeing the interest group sort of branch out a little bit more than we have in this past year. And of course, this past year has been absolutely atypical. And I know I could not have um, put anything more in my on my calendar or in my schedule this past year than I did. But I'm hoping that that's all going to change. And I'm sure that that's true for everybody. And so I'm hoping that's going to change for all of us uh, 
gradually over the next year where we might actually be able to think about uh, sticking our heads out of the hole in the ground that we've been in and, and maybe looking at um, some interesting projects to do. So does anybody have any thoughts about that? Anybody feel strongly for or against that as an idea? Okay, no strong feelings apparently. Okay, we got to sound good. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we can definitely see, I don't know, was there anything more that you wanted to sort of talk about, about that that concept, Eric? Um, I, I was just, um, <clears throat> maybe we can use that to kind of uh, head towards our next agenda item, um, talking a little bit about the matrix that, uh, that Bradley sent out, because that, that so, does kind of incorporate this project idea. Yeah, so if you're in the notes document, um, there is a link to a matrix. Uh, so the background of this, and hopefully I'm going to get this right. So this relates to a project that Bradley was particularly interested in doing, and he sort of spun up the idea of doing it. And it's a, as you can see, it's a matrix, and the idea is to in a non-judgmental way, start to define um, aspects of different preservation services so that at any point in time, somebody who needs that information could come to this and, and get a sense of what service might meet their needs that they have at that particular moment. You know, you might have any given institution have various needs for various types of materials. And maybe those needs are better served by different uh, preservation services for different types of materials. So it's the idea is again, for it not to be a competition amongst these preservation services, not to set up a, a, a ranking or a rating, but, but simply to um, create information that's easily accessible for all different kinds of institutions to be able to sort of get a sense of what services are available. So he had, um, I'm, I'm not sure where, when he started it, but it eventually sort of went over and was being worked on at AP Trust. Uh, but he feels like uh, it makes more sense for this to be an NDSA project rather than uh, within the confines of a given vendor or a given service. Um, and it seems like a perfect um, project in the vein of what we were just talking about in terms of having interests that spin off to a project, potentially a working group with members of various interest groups being involved in that working group to represent the aspects of the NDSA so that it's represented in the project. Um, is everyone able to get to uh, I'm in the wrong account? All right. Is everyone able, able to get to the uh, matrix? Any thoughts or opinions about it? Hi, y'all. Um, hey, Chelsea. Uh, uh, I think this is a really uh, wonderful tool that um, as someone who's starting a brand new preservation network um, with no experience in digital <laughs> preservation at all, um, this kind of a, a tool would be enormously uh, helpful. Um, I actually just before this was writing uh, an email to um, kind of our, our technology uh, working group to ask like, okay, how do we choose a service or a vendor? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, being able to point them in, in the direction of a, a matrix like this uh, would have been enormously helpful. Um, so all that to say, like we're in the process of, of actually doing this and finding this kind of information now. So um, mm -hmm. we'd be happy to, to help or contribute or learn or Great. whatever, whatever y'all need. <laughs> 
Okay, so you feel like this is an appropriate thing for this interest group to be putting forward for somebody, for a working group to work on and to sort of have some input into. Yes, I would love that. <laughs> Great. Any other thoughts about it? Anybody, uh, anybody have any sort of concerns about the interest group moving in this direction? Okay, great. Yeah. It'd be interesting, it would be, um... You know, if we do move in this sort of direction, uh, at least for some of the time we get together, uh, it would also be, you know, great to have folks mention you know, what kind of balance they would like to see between, you know, the amount of times we, uh, the number of times we have, we ask speakers to join us, uh, or uh, the amount of time we actually spend working together on something like, uh, like this matrix or discussing ideas surrounding it. Um, but that kind of balance will be important as well to kind of get a group read on. Yeah. But that, you know, um, while we're still on the, the topic of, of that matrix, I, I think it's, um, you know, like I, I started going through this a little bit uh, when Bradley sent it to us. And, and one of the things he mentioned uh, is that of course there's, you'll see this uh, one row that, that mentions the, um, the ISO 16363 uh, standard. And, it, you know, it looks like there are actual section numbers from that um, uh, from, to, you know, qualify the different parts of, or the different columns. And, um, you know, I was looking at like the, the content management um, tab, <clears throat> which, uh, which kind of goes over uh, digital object management. And it, and it just feels like that particular tab does have some overlap with the actual levels of preservation uh, matrix that that's out there. And that would, you know, to me, that's like one of those really um, attractive places to start a discussion mm -hmm. and to, um, and to, to talk about, okay, well, for, you know, for example, if we, we sit here and look at this matrix, consider the levels of preservation, um, you know, it's like, should we talk about, you know, does a, a service provider make use of storage in, you know, uh, facilities in or, or across multiple geographic locations? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what types of reporting are made availability, or, or I'm sorry, are made available through that service provider? Um, and, and on that second example, like, you know, is there the appropriate amount of granularity that's there for the person who's using it um, in order to, you know, maybe address uh, the third or fourth level of the levels of preservation and like the integrity or content like functional areas, that sort of thing. If you look at that matrix as well, see, see where these things um, kind of overlap, but, but they're just, it just feels like there's a lot of good fodder for conversation there. And, um, and we could, you know, we could kind of pick and choose and see what, what folks are, are um, interested in talking about. Uh, so Terry uh, has put a question in the chat. Uh, how many rows do you envision in responding? The general purpose repositories that are preservation-ish systems be included? I, I think that that's probably one of the questions. That, I mean, this isn't a group yet, but I would imagine that that would be one of the first questions that the group might talk about is what is the scope of this and, you know, what would be useful for, you know, any for people uh, in general coming into this without getting too um, in too deep in the weeds for things that are very specific to an individual institution. Uh, I think, I would think that as long as uh, it's information that could be used by uh, other people, so it was a system that wasn't specific to a single institution. I mean, I would think that the point isn't to be a showcase of preservation systems, uh, but um, information about what systems other uh, institutions might use. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, I, I, I would imagine it could potentially get uh, fairly specific. Um, so beyond just the big vendors, um, 
but again, it would be it'll be the group that that has to decide that. And to Eric's point, um, it was something that Bradley had sort of thinking out loud. You know, he had said, you know, we could color code this so to Matt to to link into the levels of preservation. So I think what you're saying, Eric, totally fits the model that he had been thinking about is that some of these things really map very clearly and very concretely to to levels and that where they do that that it would be useful to do something like color code them for that. Right, right. Try to line up that those uh direct yeah. yeah direct correlations there. Yeah. And it 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 reminds me of so you might have seen the announcement last week that the curatorial and I can't remember what its final name ended up being, but the it's a curatorial overlay on top of the levels of preservation that I helped that team work on over this past year. Uh, and it's kind of that same thing. It's, it's a workflow for, um, for curators who may not be really dealing with digital preservation or have particular knowledge of digital preservation concepts or systems. So it's a, it's a curatorial workflow that then overlays or connects to the levels of preservation. So uh, a curator, as they're considering a collection, bringing in a collection into their institution, you know, here are the preservation considerations uh, that you should be aware of before you bring that collection into your into your institution, you know, you have to think about these things and the ramifications of that. So it, it sort of feels a little bit uh, like this in that way, you know, trying to find interesting tools that coordinate with the levels of preservation or act as I said, as an overlay on top. So I think that's what this could definitely be as well. Any other thoughts about this? Okay, so if we wanna jump back to topics for, for upcoming meetings, uh, Eric, do you wanna, seeing as you created the, the Tricitor poll, do you wanna talk about? And I think you also had added some topics to the old Tricitor poll. Um, yeah, um, yo, know, there's there's uh, a link that's there right now in uh, the running meeting notes doc. There are, um, yeah, just that poll link. Um, there are some topics that uh, I had um, thought about. I haven't listed them there yet, but I can certainly uh, talk about them a little bit uh, to see if folks uh, think we should add them to the list. Um, yeah, sure. So, Okay. We are we free to just throw things in there now, or uh... does everyone have um, Eric? When you set it up, do people have permission to add things? Yeah, it should be should be open, um, and you shouldn't need to sign in or anything like that to add a topic. But let me know if that doesn't work that way, though. Um, that I, gonna... I think Terry, if you have ideas, I I think that's great. If you want to add them in, we'll do. Uh, yeah, sure. So. So um, a couple of the things that I, you know, I was I was thinking about are um, one of, one of those things is uh, the um, Oxford Common File Layout, uh, the OCFL, and um, you know this is this is a standard that just reached its like 1.0 miles milestone this year, and um, you know it's. it's I think it's probably being considered by uh, a bunch of folks, or, or you know, it's, it at least has uh, some some limelight in in the community. And one of the questions that comes up whenever I think about OCFL, and I know Terry and I have also talked about this, is that is you know how does the OCFL um, specification really, uh, or how does it play nicely with like cloud storage? Um, so what does that mean, like uh, in terms of you know, once an OCFL like object is is present in cloud storage, you know, how do you interact with it? 
uh, how do you revise it? How do you add a version? Um, are there certain like things about the the actual object keys that might be pro you know problematic when it comes to up to cloud storage, that sort of thing? Um, and I that that could be a good you know conversation starter. A um, couple other things. Um, so several times in different like blog posts and things that I've seen come out this year, um, you know, the one of those topics that comes up relatively um, uh, frequently is, you know, environmental footprint and environmental impact of storage in the cloud um, for, for digital preservation. So, you know, most people are, well, I wouldn't say most, I can't say anything like that, but, you know, the, if you have on-premise uh, on-premise, um, you know, storage, that's one thing that you can, of course, you know, try to figure out in terms of environmental impact. Um, but how, what does that really mean when it comes to, um, you know, evaluating your impact when you're using all these cloud storage providers? Um, this is another topic, like how do you actually get around, how do you, how do you dig into that? Um, does it, does it have to do with like compute time or like the amount of like, compute intensive operations that your repository is running against a cloud storage provider, that sort of thing. Um, and really, how can you, do you have any way of tracking any of that? Um, I know one thing that's been, uh, you know, brought up uh, very recently at DigiPres was um, information security policies and dealing with sensitive information and, um, and you know, building a workflow for a repository and you know how does sensitive inf sensitive information actually map into that space and what does it mean um so that's kind of a big broad topic that maybe we could take a look at um so yeah those are those are a few of the things i i think the um yeah uh i'll, I'll put those out there the, the scaling and fixity uh issue that jeremy mentioned earlier is also really interesting to me um, and so what does that mean when it comes to cloud computing as well, or cloud cloud storage and compute costs and that sort of thing? Right. I even, that was the first one I captured because that was the first, that, that same idea came to mind when Jeremy mentioned that earlier. It's certainly a question I find, I find us asking. Yeah. Hi. Um, so there were a few topics that were on the poll from last time that I don't think that we covered. And um, I can throw these in to see if um, they have um, more relevance to people now. But I can tell you one is a geographic distribution in cloud environments. Um, policies, diversification is their true dis uh, distribution, threat zones, et cetera. Um, I think Nathan had put in one on risk management and he gave a link to a PASIG talk. So uh, I can include that. Um, next generation storage technology, Microsoft's research DNA and glass storage technologies, potentially others. Um, cloud compute. So cloud functions that are not specifically storage um, cost modeling and things like that, which I can tell you from experience, at least when we did it at the beginning of this year, was incredibly obtuse. Even to the Google engineers that we were working with, they, they did not have a real clear uh, idea of what things were going to cost and stuff like that. So could be interesting. Uh, API consistency across cloud providers. And then um, what do all the nines mean? So, you know, people in digital preservation talk about numbers of nines and, and what does that actually mean? So I can throw these into the poll. Are there other topics that anybody can think of at the moment um, that you'd like to throw out there, have a discussion about? And Leah, I'd definitely say <clears throat> at least three of those items you mentioned still are interesting to me to hear about. So. Me too, as I'm looking at it, it's like, yeah, no, I would really like to hear more about this. So uh, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't consider any of them dead personally on my part, but if there are, if there are things in there that other people are particularly interested in, 
well, you'll get a chance to indicate that because we will do a we'll do a vote just like we did uh, last year. So, so one of the things that we were going to talk about at the beginning, and I forgot about, was things like note taking, <laughs> and um, one of the great things with the Zoom recording that is set up by DLF um, is they or the Zoom meeting is they record it. So I can always go back and uh, fill in the notes. I'll be happy to do that this time when I'm looking at the recording anyway to put up on um, YouTube. But it would be useful um, to sort of talk about what would be a good paradigm for us to follow in terms of taking notes for the meetings. Would people be uh, amenable to sort of rotating note-taking duties? Is there anybody who particularly loves taking notes and would like to take them? <laughs> I will be shocked if there is, but you never know. Okay, well maybe Eric, uh, we can put that on the agenda for our shiny new year meeting in January and which actually, um, I have not looked at the calendar for January. We should look at that. Yeah, it looks like. The 18th, which is right. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. holiday. So stay tuned to your email, that. but Eric and I will sort of discuss what day maybe we want to move that to. I can tell you off the top of my head, I'd be more inclined to move it than a week later than a week earlier, just because a week, everybody's just getting back from vacation and things like that. Um, oh, and a week earlier, but like I said, that's just off the top of my head. There might be really good reasons to do it a week earlier, but in and any case- I think case, you may have we, a President's Day conflict as well, so- um, if Yeah, you we had one. this last year, the same thing. The danger of having meetings on Monday. So, but Eric and I can have a discussion about uh, when we think we should move the January and February meetings to, and we'll let you know, rather than trying to figure it out on the spot right now. Yeah. Does that work for Sounds you, Eric? Good. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, but at our, at our January meeting, whenever it is, um, we can talk about housekeeping tasks, like taking notes and things like that, if, if that's okay with you as well. Work. And then yeah. also we can continue the discussion. We probably will not have a speaker at the January meeting. I'm kind of guessing unless something comes up where we can find somebody um, early in January to do it. But we could continue this discussion. We'll probably have more people uh, at the January meeting. I wasn't didn't have high expectations for, for a lot of people at this meeting so close to Christmas. But uh, and then we can also uh, take another look at the poll. So if you have ideas about topics, um, feel free to add them to the poll. If you don't want to add them directly to the poll, you can send them to Eric or to me and we will add them. Um, and then we can take a look at starting the voting. So, so everyone should have um, editing capability in the voting notes, right? Or is that not the, I was just going to say we, you know, if you don't want to add them to the poll directly, you can always mention them in the notes or whichever yeah. works. So, yeah. I, I certainly see a link to say add argument. So I'm guessing I can, I'm guessing I can add something, and I think everybody should be able to do that. Okay. But again, feel free to contact either of us if you have any problems. Yeah, definitely. 